Hi, uh, welcome to Land Management 2.0, the uh, fourth webinar in this series. Um, we've got some really interesting talks today looking at designing farms for the future. How do we make them fit? How do we make them appropriate for what we're looking to do? Um, two really interesting speakers at the moment who I'm sure are familiar to a lot of you, Charlie Steer and, and Jake Freestone. Um, from my side, I will be chairing the session and, and looking through the questions. So please, as you think of them, put, put some questions out to, uh, to get some debate going through. Uh, my name is Rich Reynolds. I look after the agriculture team in Anglian Water and, and we're really pleased to support this. So across to you, Tim. Great, thank you, Rich. And yeah, welcome to another webinar. Um, my name is Tim Hopkin. Um, I'm the founder of Land App and Land Management 2.0. So really everything we're doing is about helping progress the land management conversation, helping people get the information they need, be connected to the network that they need to make the best, most progressive decisions, especially as we start to transition into regenerative agriculture, natural capital market and ELM. So it's a real pleasure to be here and support you. Um, we really look forward to this conversation. As Rich said, please feel free to ask any questions you've got as the presentations are underway and Rich will be scooping them up at the end in the Q&A section to ask them to the speakers. So um, please feel free to participate, get involved and yeah, really get the most out of this session as you possibly can. So without any further ado, um, I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, Jake Freestone, uh, the farm manager at Overbury Enterprise. Um, Jake, over to you for your presentation. Tim, thank you very much indeed, and um, absolutely delighted to be here uh, with everybody uh, on this virtual uh, virtual presentation and talk that we've got lined up for you today. So, um, yeah, Tim, fantastic, thank you. Um, I'm Jake Freestone. I'm the farm manager at uh, Overbury Enterprises, and um, hopefully we should be able to start to get some slides going. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about regenerative agriculture and how we can use this style of uh, sustainable farming to produce nutrient rich food with less input and impact on the environment, which we all know is going to play more and more of a role in our food production systems going further forward. Um, Overbury sits on the Gloucestershire Worcestershire border. It's a really mixed farm. We've got Evesham series clay, sand over gravel, um, and then Cotswold brash up to a thousand feet above sea level. Um, so it's quite challenging. It's mixed with arable crops, uh, combinable crops, some land let for salad onion and, uh, and dwarf French beans and beetroot production. Um, and also we have a sheep flock um, of uh, just over a thousand ewes, which look after the permanent pasture and actually now more some uh, grass lays that are uh, rotating around the arable system. Um, in 2013, I did a Nuffield Farming Scholarship, uh, which was title, entitled Breaking the Wheat Yield Plateau in the UK. And I very quickly came back to the conclusion that there isn't actually a silver bullet to help us reach these higher yields um, based on uh, world population increase. <clears throat> but actually, there's a whole host of different things we should be doing to our fields um, and our food production system to actually reduce the input. Um, but we can still achieve um, higher outputs. Um, and one of the uh, light bulb moments happened to me in Oklahoma. Um, I was at the Nobel Foundation and um, that was founded by Lloyd Noble. Um, and in 1914, he said um, that the land must continue to supply our food, our clothing and our fuel long after the oil has gone. And that to me resonated in terms of the challenges that we face um, going forward. So today I want to talk a little bit about regenerative agriculture. What is it? I want to talk about the benefits, that's some business benefits and environmental benefits as well. And what I like about this farming system is that there are multi-layered effects um, that just keep on building. Um, and then a little look uh, further forward in terms of future opportunities. And actually, you know, uh, Tim just mentioned um, elms, um, biodiversity net gain, carbon trading, all of these things uh, will be starting to have an input into our businesses. Um, but to start with, I was just thinking about what does it actually mean, regenerative agriculture? It's a system of farming principles and practices that increases biodiversity, enriches soils, improves watersheds, and enhances ecosystem services, which is quite a lot of, um, you know, big long words in there for a simple farmer like myself. But it's about, uh, it's about trying to do less interference um, and farm in a more natural way. Um, you know, you look around the environment that we see 
and uh, a lot of the answers are, all, are already there. But what's Regen itself? It's about minimizing soil disturbance. It's about keeping the soil covered. It's about long and diverse rotations. And then it's also about additional livestock. So in terms of um, minimal disturbance, this is absolutely crucial to protect our soil. And uh, traditionally agriculture in the middle of August would have been brown fields everywhere. Historically, that's been our wettest month. And actually that's when our soils are most exposed to soil erosion. Um, but by keeping the soil covered, we're actually keeping it armored. It's a great expression from North America, this soil armor. It's protecting the soil from wind, from sun, from erosion. Uh, it's keeping it cooler. And it's also by not moving the soil, not doing so much cultivations, we're actually reducing our environmental footprint by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, our NOx emissions from our, from our land. Um, and in fact, here on the farm, we've reduced our um, carbon emissions from uh, just over 123 tonnes of CO2 equivalent down to about 63 tonnes of CO2 equivalent by making this switch on our combinable cropped acreages. So it's quite a significant saving in terms of environmental benefits, but also financial benefits as well. It also reduces the leaching by not mineralizing so much nitrogen from the soil. Uh, it's a cultivator system would be leaching and, and mineralizing about 60 kilos a hectare of nitrogen. Uh, we're probably doing about 20. Um, so immediately that is still locked up in the soil that our crops are able to utilize later on, reducing our need for synthetic inputs later on. It also increases drainage by not moving the soil. We've got roots and worm channels in place, which significantly enable us to store more water in our soils. And that just looking out of the window today is really important going forward. This is some of our soil, some lovely worm channels in there. Um, we've got water infiltration rates now of just over 100 mils per hour up on our Cotswold brash soils. But even on our heavy soils, we are infiltrating at nearly 25 mils an hour, which is quite a significant increase on where we were before we started this journey. This also enables increases of organic matter within our soils by not mineralizing them from the ground. So from the 2014 to 2021, we've seen soil organic matter levels increase by about 1.7%, so 0.2 of a percent a year, which is a really positive step forward in terms of reducing our environmental footprint, but also sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. And that carbon you can see on this photograph here with roots in the soil, uh, residue left in behind it. But actually these roots are really important and that organic matter means it's more, more water storage. The bigger the sponge effectively, the more cation exchange capacity it has, the more that soil is able to hold on to nutrients, not release them into the wider environment uh, for water companies down the line to have to take out again. Um, the worm channels also give fantastic aeration uh, and give structure to the soil as well, actually helping it breathe. So soil disturbance is, is really, in, well, the, <laughs> the lack of soil disturbance is really important. You can't really do that without having uh, soil armor and keeping the soil covered through cover crops. Um, and, then, and they are really, really advantageous in our particular farming system. Uh, nutrient creation and capture. So crops like rye and vetch together have the possibility to be sequestering and, and uh, capturing over 200 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. We are particularly poor as an industry in the utilization of nitrogen, somewhere in the region of 55 to 70% if we're lucky. And I can imagine going to a cash machine and taking hundred pounds out and dropping 40 quid of it straight on the floor. You just wouldn't be happy. Yet we are quite prepared to do that with nitrogen. And I think that's something that we really need to look at in our overall farming system. How can we reduce that effect? It's also very, very, um, bad in terms of carbon emissions, both in its manufacture, but also the effect that it has on the soil. So nitrogen, really, really important. Um, the use of cover crops with legumes in it can help capture and manufacture atmospheric nitrogen through, um, through photosynthesis and um, using legumes to try, and, uh, to try and improve that nitrogen content in our soils. Uh, we're reducing our soil compaction by having roots in the ground, going down deep, removing that compaction, creating channels, creating airways, and improving soil health. Soil is made healthy by plants living on it and pushing carbon from the atmosphere down into the root zone, creating glomalin, which helps stick the soil together, uh, maintaining it in the field um, and actually feeding that, that uh, animal life that is, uh, that is beneath our feet. <clears throat> it's got a brilliant opportunity for create, creating and encouraging pollination sources. 
uh, improving water infiltration is really, really important at these times of uh, heavy rainfall, uh, long, longer periods of rain. We need to have that better water management, uh, getting rid of it in abundance, but then actually holding on to it in terms in times of really dry weather. <clears throat> we need to get the most out of our money. So we have a five minute fallow here if we, if we possibly can at Overbury, um, certainly within 24 hours um, of getting cover crops established. At that time of year, we have uh, warm temperatures. There's normally a bit of moisture around to get some small seeds to grow. We've got good day length um, and um, it's the best opportunity to get the, uh, the most we can from that investment of seed and, uh, and diesel with the, uh, with the drilling effect. <clears throat> we're quite happy to spend some money on our cover crops as well. Uh, the longer the crop is in the ground, then the more likely we are to spend some money on it. And it really needs to be diverse. These one or two or three way species um, really don't happen in nature. Uh, so diversity is key. And I'll show you that in the, in the next slide. Timing is also so important right up behind the combine to get the maximum benefit. Um, and these are some of the benefits that can be seen. So in terms of keeping that soil covered, we've got some lovely mixed species cover crops. We've got a deep tillage radish going on there. It's a fodder radish actually going down 80, 90 centimeters, those roots showing uh, no sign of compaction, but actually able to bring nutrients up from depth as well. But if you're not interested in cover crops, particularly just retaining the straw um, and a nice even chop enables that minimal disturbance uh, drilling, direct drilling, no-till drilling to actually occur. Um, and then the crop on the on the right hand side here, this is a sunflower root, and you can just see the amount of biomass that that is able to generate in a relatively short space of time being a, a C4 plant. Um, it shows structure, it's holding the soil together, and actually when we come and plant into that, um, the soil doesn't move very much, enabling us to reduce our weed, uh, uh, our weed germination as well, which is really, really important. The combination of carbon and nitrogen ratios must be thought about as well. Um, so we're not actually taking the soil with too much carbon um, and, then you, and then leaving uh, nutrients short for the following crop. Um, and also rotation, um, not growing wheat oilseed rape, wheat oilseed rape, uh, which, is, which is damaging from, from a soil health point of view. It's also not good for a resistant strategy. Um, so here we, we grow quite a few different break crops um, uh, on the farm. We're looking at some different ones along the bottom here. We've got a bit of winter linseed, we've got some soya, um, and then we've got some quinoa as well. And this helps us with risk management in terms of that business resilience, uh, in terms of, of, of the weather, timing of planting, timing of harvest, uh, can create some storage issues, um, but you can plan ahead for those. And resistance strategies, very, very crucial in terms of black grass, in terms of cabbage stem flea beetle, um, aphids and the like to actually enable us to have um, better marketing opportunities. And then in terms of the diversity, can we actually grow into crops together or companion cropping? This is a mixture of vetches, um, buckwheat, phacelia and bursine clover in with oilseed rape. Um, it's saving us inputs, uh, it's improving the carbon capture. We've got twice the biomass on the left hand side. Um, those crops uh, tissue sampled more in balance with the target um, and ultimately ends up with a higher margin at the end of the day, which it helps us with our, again, with our business resilience. And then additional livestock, and I'm not just thinking about the above ground livestock here in terms of our sheep flock, um, grazing um, stubble turnips and vetches, but actually the ladybird was a, um, a picture I took in, uh, in one of our cover crops of winter bean, uh, of beans and uh, oats. Um, feasting quite happily on an aphid. So I think there's a lot of margin in terms of um, looking after the livestock and actually helping them in our arable rotations. Uh, also helps the livestock enterprise as well. Our ewes now are lambing outdoors. They don't come in at all. That saved us in the region of 15,000 pounds a year. Uh, we're not making hay and silage anymore. We're not using losing a few ewes to listeriosis. Um, and they're getting a much faster return of nutrients back from the soil through the plants and then back onto the land again. Uh, ewe condition has improved, colostrum volume and um, quality has improved and so has lamb survival. So from a livestock point of view, being able to rest the grassland is also important um, and enable them to, um, to improve their flock performance and their flock margin. And also the, the center picture at the bottom here, um, fungi in the soil, absolutely crucial in terms of um, helping move nutrients around in the field 
um, that <clears throat> that rhizosphere between the plant and the and the soil. Um, you need to have a very active soil biological life to actually enable nutrients and moisture to move within the plants. And it culminates really in terms of livestock grazing arable. These are some ewes up on uh, Breeden Hill, grazing stubble turnips mixed with vetch, um, a relatively steep sloping field where we've started grazing at the top. So we've always got a buffer in front of the sheep. Um, uh, and, um, and by using no-till principles, we are able to uh, manage the soil and the water that falls on here through the winter time. Um, and also reducing our fertilizer uh, input as well. This was grown on 40 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen. Uh, it's following a spring, uh, so winter wheat crop actually, um, and some biological inputs as well to try and fix atmospheric nitrogen, reduce our costs and also reduce our impact on the environment. And how are we managing some of this? Well, we're working quite closely with uh, the West Midland bird ringers um, <clears throat> who have been out actually monitoring, recording, and looking at some of the uh, some of the species that we have on the farm here, we've been doing recording since 2004, and things like skylarks on a couple of fields have gone up from sort of um, 17 pairs to 44 pairs up on the hill, um, with with the right sort of management that goes hand in hand with our regenerative principles, and things like uh, worm counting. Uh, it's a great project at the moment with Jackie Stroud looking at the 30 minute worms. Um, you know, dig a hole. Um, 16 worms in a spadeful equates to 400 in a square meter, which is the target population. Um, doesn't take long to do, and it's a really great insight into exactly where we are in terms of our, our soil health. But actually, the farmland birds are a really key indicator species for us. So what can we do about uh, moving this forward? Um, I think to start with, it is a systems approach. We need to get ahead of the game and we need to start learning how we can put this together from a business survival and resilience point of view, but also from our wider environment. Uh, we do have an impact on our environment. We need to reduce that um, each year more and more. I think the answer certainly does lie beneath our feet in terms of how we manage our soil. It's our biggest asset. And it's one that I think a lot of farmers slightly underestimate um, the, um, the fragileness of uh, how we manage it and the fact that it can, uh, that we need it to be healthy to support our businesses and our families and our, our futures going forward. But I also think it gives us huge opportunity uh, in terms of reducing the costs of production, which we're going to need to do, but actually interest uh, in the carbon and the biodiversity that farming like this is able to support. And thank you very much indeed. I shall now stop sharing and head back to Tim. Great, thank you, Jake fascinating as expected so thank you very much for that um so next we have charlie steer so charlie is the arable manager at grosvenor farms so charlie over to you thank you tim i'll just uh, start sharing my screen great we've got it got it okay yeah as um Tim said, I'm uh, the Arable Manager at Grosvenor Farms. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Fascinating presentation, Jacob, really enjoyed that. Um, so I'm the Arable Manager here. I've been here for 11 years, uh, started in 2010 on a rural graduate scheme. Uh, and as far as I know, I was the first and last person to do that. So it was either a great success or a miserable failure. Um, but my role encompasses all the operations for growing combinable crops, forage crops, uh, including agronomy, the labour and machinery side, um, but also the sort of land related stuff on the farm, uh, sustainability and stewardship schemes. So uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to try and share with you our business strategy for sustainability, um, the sort of circular farming principles and the common thread which runs through uh, the estate and all the businesses of Grosvenor, uh, how this strategy sort of shapes our mission and vision. Um, hopefully, uh, well, there is a board behind me, but um, I shall share that in a second. Um, and just make sure all our stakeholders and employees are heading in the right direction. I'll then elaborate on some of the practical measures uh, we've implemented here to make this strategy and the mission a reality. As with most farming businesses, um, it's evolved over the years according to sort of external factors, market demand, some subsidy and innovation. A little bit of background on Grosvenor Farms. Um, we're a commercial enterprise. We're the other side of the Pennines to Anglian Water Country. Um, 
we're situated on the Eaton Estate, but are a separate entity. So um, myself, the livestock manager, Dave Craven, and our director, Mark Roach, all answer to a board. The main enterprises are a mixed dairy and arable farm. We're milking 2,500 cows three times a day, producing 90,000 litres of milk. Uh, we rear all our own replacements with some surplus to sell. And we also um, integrate this with 6,000 odd acres, uh, which is in our tenure. It's about a 50-50 split between combinable and forage crops. About 11% of our uh, land is in environmental schemes, both higher and mid-tier stewardship, as well as some voluntary stuff. Uh, we've got quite a big stock of natural capital here, which we're proud of, uh, 136 miles of hedgerows, 134 ponds and mole pits and 13 kilometres of river frontage and the adjacent triple SI along the River Dee. Uh, we're one of the opcos of Wheat Sheep Investments Group. So this is Grosvenor um, Family's non-property investment and um, they're diversified into food and agriculture businesses globally. Let's put a little more flesh on the bones about the farm. Uh, we were established 47 years ago uh, with 600 acres from what was Eaton Home Farm. Um, we've been through several sort of iterations in the time, uh, in split into sort of three S's. The S for spuds in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, we then go into a, a strange one, semen. We were a big uh, cattle breeding um, enterprise uh, with cogent breeding being born out of Grover Farms from 1998 to 2018. And now we're in a sort of sustainability phase using integrated mixed farming. Uh, with the largest tenants on the Eaton estate, about half the land uh, on the estate is in our control. There's a dozen other tenant farmers, a thousand acres of forestry, a deer park and a golf course, which make up the balance. 55 uh, people work here, a turnover of approximately 12 million. Principal soil types, uh, a bit like Jake, we've got a bit of diversity, um, mostly a, a Cheshire clay. Uh, on the cl classification, it's very borderline between clay and clay loam. Um, 28% of the farm is on the floodplain, so that's alluvial soils. And the remainder is a sandy loam over sandstone. So in the old uh, soil series, it's a, it's a sort of Newport um, series. We are fairly dry, uh, fairly low lying and fairly flat. Our arable rotation tends to be geared around winter cropping. Um, springs like the one we're having at the moment haven't really suited us. Um, so winter wheat, a uh, whole crop winter oats, uh, back into winter wheat, uh, winter barley, uh, winter oilseed rape. We've got a 190 hectare block of temporary grassland and clover lays cycling inside um, that rotation. We grow 215 of hectares of maize and the rest we source from other farming businesses locally. And then uh, we also have a, a sort of smattering of some spring whole crop. So we've been experimenting with different legume and cereal mixtures. So triticale and vetch uh, seems to be, to be good on this farm. The maize ground uh, just to add as well is um, now in a sort of enhanced management. So we plant um, a farm safe seed winter rye, uh, forage rye into the stubble immediately after harvest, a bit like Jake's uh, system, the drill followed, follows the forage harvester. Uh, and we get that growing to knit the soil together, uh, absorb nutrient and um, keep that armor on the ground over the winter. So to shape our strategy, we sort of had to take the global picture into account. Um, this so-called triple challenge of a 30% increase in global protein demand in the next 29, 30 years uh, and the resources this is going to soak up. You then couple that with consumers uh, demand and a global nexus of issues around climate change, uh, land use change, and then pressures to make uh, production truly sustainable. To top that off, there's a squeeze on producer economics. So in some cases, this is in conflict with the best practice, um, producing problems such as diffuse pollution and um, things like that. But we, we've got a feeling that uh, UK dairy farming, when integrated with food production for human consumption, provides a really sustainable pollution uh, for us. Uh, and as a, as a sort of touched on the, the climate in this part of the world gives us a real competitive advantage for milk production. 
all the Grosvenor businesses um, run around the common thread and, and the core of which is the delivery of strong commercial results to the shareholders. And there's a sort of old adage that if you're in the red, there's rarely any green. So we have to be commercially um, minded to, to make sure we can deliver as many of the outcomes around the center of the common thread there. So just to sort of sum up what's on your screen, um, the Grosvenor family have uh, been here since the Norman conquest. So well over 700 years, they're using that perspective to improve the, the future of the land, efficiently use natural resources, uh, to do more good in the communities that uh, surround the, the estate and the farms. We want to keep improving the land for the future and then use innovation and ambition to meet high standards throughout uh, all that process. And hopefully that will sort of come across in the rest of the presentation. Um, like Jake, I'm also a Nuffield Scholar from 2019 and I was uh, delighted to be able to, dis to study sort of circular agriculture and to understand this, a quick slide on the fundamentals that underpin sort of flow of materials and energy from, from cradle to grave. Um, basically, in the, since the Industrial Revolution, we've, we've been taking stuff out of the ground, we've been making it into a stuff, using it, and then either losing it or chucking it away. Um, all while fueling the process with sort of finite resources. Now we can argue farming slightly different in that it does integrate some natural systems. Um, but you know, in the time that uh, I've been around, it's been mainly solutions out of a bottle since Justice von Liebig sort of burnt his ash samples and decided we can make fertilizer in some old um, bomb factories. Um, it, it, it allowed the neglect of some of the principles that have gone before that um, Jake sort of really introduce you to there so using animal manures rotational diversity uh, livestock integration um having said that you know the change has, has been a lot of good there's been a lot of uh, people that aren't going hungry thanks to thanks to the the, the methods of agriculture um that we've been using but at the same time yields have plateaued uh, and inputs are going up so there needs to be a a change at some point so the circular economy doesn't just sort of bend the, the ends of the linear nature uh, around to form a circle, but it, it reimagines the way that materials and energy flow. And there's one principle, which is the absolute uh, minimization of waste. So capturing value in whatever you do at each stage of the chain. Now on, on the Nuffield Travels, I came across some, some great innovators, guys using um, vermiculture, six acres of worms to capture nutrients. Um, Farmers like Jake maintaining green cover and uh, even people just employing lean management techniques to reduce waste of time. Now, the Dutch are absolute leaders in this. Um, they've committed to being fully circular by 2050. Back home in the UK, uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's really outlined well the uh, label of regenerative agriculture in the circular economy and that, that it builds uh, soil and human health links resilience both biologically and financially for farmers and protects the livelihoods of those who work on the land. At the uh, conclusion of this, they, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation have got two really good, really, three really good principles, sorry, uh, to design out waste and pollution, to keep materials in use and regenerate natural systems. Now, when trying to think about how to develop a circular farm, I, there's an approach of, called systems thinking, which um, sort of goes against human nature sometimes, which is to try and rationalize and simplify things and sometimes too much so. Um, as a lot of you will know, running a farm business requires a sort of broad range of skills. So we can be soil scientists, accountants, vets, HR advisors, PR managers, and so on and so forth. So the old jack of all trades, master of none used to be in. Charlie, we've just lost your audio a bit. Count when uh, this comes in. Oh, we've got you again. Yeah, sorry, what happened then? Just lost your audio for about five seconds. Uh, okay. Back again. Yeah, I'll carry on as, as it was then because I don't know where you lost me. So on, on the back of this, we sort of looked into the tools of system systems thinkers and um, brought that into action on the farm. So just slightly contradicting myself, I'm now going to have to sort of disassemble our farm systems to um, communicate to you guys how it fits into to the, the way the farms run today. So the first thing we're looking at is uh, the upcycling. So 
animals the world over are great at upcycling cellulose into a protein rich food stuff. So as I mentioned, 28% of the farm, it floods. Uh, over the years, there's all sorts been tried down there, maize, potatoes, cereals. And as you can see in the picture, summer flooding is something that we're going to have to get used to. Um, what, um, what the cows are doing is upcycling the cellulose we're growing on grass from there into a nutritionally complete, affordable, whole filled, also known as milk. Other parts of the farm where uh, we're growing combinable crops, we're keeping hold of the residuals. So the straw is baled. Um, we don't sell any off the farm. We keep it all for feed and bedding. It's then returned as manure. When we sell off wheat, uh, a lot of it goes up to Trafford Park for processing into starch. Uh, we then get the waste products back as a form of Trafford Gold going into the dairy diet. Our milling wheat also goes off for milled bread, uh, which comes back onto the farm if uh, it's going as waste in the human food chain. Likewise, with oilseed rape, it, uh, once it's had oil, it's pressed into meal and the cows upcycle that into, uh, into a great protein. On the resource efficiency side of things, um, I've tried to link it here. We've, we've got a certain amount of uh, finite resources. So we've got, to, we've got to generate renewable electricity to sort of power our farm. Um, we, need, we need heat uh, in the dairy. We also need cooling. We need quite a bit of water. And then we want to capture and reuse the nutrient wherever possible. So just to try and link everything together here, the solar um, runs the separation systems for the manure and sand during the day. The sand, which is obviously mined out the ground, about 85% of that is recycled back into bedding. The water comes out of the borehole cold, goes through the milk cooling into a heat recovery system where it preheats the water to 50 degrees. The water then goes um, from the hot and cold wash water, it's recaptured into a flood wash system, then into the sand uh, recycling. And finally, it goes off the farm uh, well, goes into the arable system as a, as a great fertilizer. Following on for that, the manure fits into a bigger nutrient management picture. So the manure separation leaves me with two products, a solid and a liquid, and um, both are applied to growing crops. Uh, so the liquids used, we both inject and low trajectory spread to uh, mitigate against ammonia emissions, uh, usually before winter oilseed rape and spring cropping. Uh, we're quite fortunate the legacy of growing a lot of potatoes left us with storage and pumping infrastructure that makes us pretty efficient at moving uh, this liquid around the farm. The solid materials uh, top dressed on growing crops um, or sometimes stubbles where it's appropriate. So all this is helping us reduce the cost and the carbon uh, emissions from the farm on both arable and forage crops and also we're increasing soil organic matter. So our average stands at just over five and a half percent. We're increasing soil biology by inoculating it with um, biology from the cow's rumen. By increasing soil organic matter, I'm hoping to sort of fit in with the Stefan LaFolle's 0.4% uh, increase in soil carbon. Although if we calculate this, we're starting at quite a high level of 3.04%. And I think that's around double the, the national average. We do have a few complications in the transition towards zero tillage to do with legislation on the incorporation of organic manures. So our tillage tends to be sort of a conservation. We've got um, the ability to do everything from direct drilling right through to the, uh, the square word that is ploughing. So the circular farming techniques I've mentioned uh, are an important part of the, the carbon story on the farm, but it's definitely not the whole picture. By employing the techniques that I've mentioned, the farm's producing um, really low carbon outputs uh, using the SIUC's uh, AgriCalc tool, which is a PASS and IPC accredited tier two carbon footprinting. Uh, the emissions from Grover Farms milk, for example, is um, 0.79 kilos of carbon per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk against the UK average of approximately 1.3. Now, uh, the cruise missile you might be wondering about, it comes in uh, as the clever bit on a cruise missile. It's his ability to read terrain using ground scanning systems uh, known as LIDAR. To make sense of our carbon figures, as well as a financial balance sheet, we've, we have an annual carbon balance sheet to go with our, our financial one. 
currently our, our emissions are our debt. Uh, we've just commissioned this LIDAR survey across 12,500 acres, the whole estate, to more accurately assess the above ground biomass. Uh, by overlying the vegetation type, we can understand with a good degree of accuracy the increase in biomass over time and the carbon stored in this. Also, it allows the monitoring of uh, hedgerows, wetlands, woodlands, etc. A byproduct of the LIDAR is a very high resolution lie of the land image. By looking at this, we can understand each and every watershed on the farm. Putting more data on that by overlaying rainfall shows where water, uh, which is potentially carrying diffuse pollution, will enter a watercourse. Once we've worked out where this might happen and the size of the intervention, we can use managed wetlands, reed beds, or even better short rotation coppice to use the nutrient laden water to convert into biomass. Uh, this can then be used for biofuel heating. It creates habitat, uh, carbon storage. It's generating a big win-win for farms, um, the soil, air, water, and biodiversity uh, on the farm as well. Just to take a quick step back to thought, I start to draw things together. Uh, the LIDAR surveys are great, um, but the knowledge that's already on farm often sort of helps optimize the land use from our point of view. Now, we're not ashamed to use all the organic and inorganic inputs at our disposal to, to pursue a high yield as yield dilutes the financial, social, and environmental costs and fits in with the sort of land sparing and sharing philosophy of sustainable intensification. But knowing how productive areas of the farm are and if their source or sink limited land can be another win-win benefit for biodiversity and water quality improvements. So the picture on the right of the screen, um, we've got a woodland, uh, a woodland edge strip next to that, which is shaded throughout most of the day. Uh, this is just allowed to, to grow wild for the for riparian strip to, to scrub up. Next to that, we've got a pollen and nectar strip. Um, which is encouraging pollinators to transition across into the arable crop, bringing all the benefits of uh, predator-prey cycles. And then we've got a wheat crop, um, and it, it's made sure that the areas that are a real pain when you've got the big machinery makes, it co makes the farming operation far more efficient. A um, bit of an anecdote on this is as a sort of a fledgling arable manager a few years ago, I decided that yield mapping was an essential and was explaining to a guy with 40 odd years under his belt driving combines, uh, why this was uh, he quickly put me right and said he could tell me where to put all this stewardship stuff so we just sat down with the map um, and that map formed the basis of the ELS scheme that we we drew all over a few years on and after spending a few quid on um, a new combine with yield mapping and it uh, it just proved to me there's one thing there's not no substitute for experience so all those original strips and plots are still in place uh, plus a few more again the benefit being that we've made fields easy to work manage and harvest by removing the awkward bits and um, also enabled us to go from two for fairly decent co sized combines to one uh, really big one and all the labor and machinery implications this has. As an added benefit, there's a win for all the wildlife pollinators and game on the estate. They also benefit from the process. So that was a sort of simple first step solution to help protect water and enhance biodiversity, which uh, we're building on and more, as more and more information comes available. Um, yeah, well, just to, to wrap it up now. So. We've um, just summed up what we're trying to do on the farm with the icons there and how this fits in with the sustainable development goals. So we're trying to uh, reduce hunger and increase food security with uh, a nutritionally complete affordable food, which is milk. Uh, promote healthy lives and reduce soil degradation by uh, our integrated and circular farming. We're preserving soil quality and the role it plays in clean water for drinking water and agricultural uh, sources. We want to safeguard land and protect cultural and national heritage, um, sustainably remanage resources to ensure that consumption is sustainable. So this again fits in with the people's diets. We're taking urgent action on the climate with our carbon footprinting and balance sheets. And we're trying to protect and to store terrestrial ecosystems. Just to finish off, um, my final thoughts would be to try and capitalize on carbon. We've got a direct correlation between our business and carbon efficiency. So it's a win-win even before entering any credits or offsetting schemes. And I'm a big fan of quotes. So um, there's a couple on the screen. Waste is simply a resource in the wrong place came from Gandhi. So how can we think about using other people's waste streams to our advantage or your waste streams to someone else's advantage? 
and also uh, a bright Yorkshireman once said, where there's muck, there's brass, which uh, was actually a title of a really good Rothamsted uh, um, article about this time last year. I think the ability to think in systems is really important, and Jake also picked up on this in his conclusions, but Da Vinci said, learn how to see, realise everything is connected to everything else, and I think that's um, a, a good take-home message from um, the whole of this, this sort of webinar series. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Charlie. So now we're going to move on to the Slido. So this is um, everyone's chance to participate. What are the barriers to changing farm design that farmers most frequently come across? So what are the barriers to changing the farm system around? Um, brilliant, here we go. So investment, mindset, finance, lack of knowledge. Hopefully today's session has helped with that finance front and center mindset. So just again, what are the barriers to changing farm design that farmers most frequently come across? And if you haven't found it yet, go to the chat function, you'll see the link, click that and you can answer the question. So vision, finance, risk, mindset, brilliant. Okay, I think that's very clear. Finance, incentives to change the system. Brilliant, that is very, very valuable. I'm gonna stop, actually I think, I'm going to stop this one and I'm going to go and ask the next question. So great. So the next question. So again, you can use your phone and click on the QR code in the top left. So are you currently using cover crops in your farm rotation? So let's see what comes out on top here. Are you currently using cover crops in your farm rotation? So eight people have answered, nine people have yeah okay someone's just started predominantly yes that's interesting okay yes but not to their full potential okay hopefully today's session has helped with that and i'm sure jake and charlie be more than happy to have a chat so yes is coming out on top okay yes but not regularly okay great great i think we'll leave that one there so i'm going to click stop go back and let's ask you the last question so this is charlie's question so Charlie's question is, how does carbon accounting affect your farm business decisions? I appreciate this might be quite new, but those, you know, are you not enough yet? It doesn't. Okay. So how does carbon accounting affect your farm business decisions? It doesn't yet. It doesn't. Not enough yet. Not yet. I think there's a bit of a thread here, Charlie. Okay. And maybe we can pick up this on the, in the Q&A. Because um, Charlie, I know you you're, you said some very interesting things about how doing this has really helped your farm business. So I think that's quite clear. It's not happening yet. It's confusing, and it, yes, it's becoming more important. I'm going to stop that. I'm going to stop sharing. And Rich, I'm going to hand over to you for the Q and A. Brilliant. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Charlie. <clears throat> some really interesting uh, presentations, and certainly got a lot of questions coming through. Um, just to kind of tie in initially on something that tries, and in my questions, I'll try and link in a couple of bits and pieces, but we've talked about monitoring, we've talked about carbon monitoring and those sort of things. From your perspective, what is one thing that you would monitor more of, one thing that you'd monitor less of? And to tie in some of the questions, um, there was, was a bit of talk around water quality. Are there any kind of things that you're doing there, organic matter, that sort of stuff. So uh, Jake, if you wanna go first. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, I think if I could turn the clock back and we were just starting on this journey, I would be measuring a lot more organic matter samples. Um, I would do a lot more infil water infiltration. Um, I would do a lot more worm counts. It's only as you start going on this journey that you actually realise uh, where it's taking you and to sort of time travel back to the beginning would, would be absolutely fascinating. In terms of where we are now, I'd love to do more water quality sampling as water leaves the farm. So we've got a stream that runs down through the lower half of the farm and I'd love to be able to have more time to um, monitor it for nitrates and phosphates uh, as it enters the farm. And then we've got all of our outfalls and streams that come off the hill and then measure it at the other end as well to actually look at what our actual impact is um, on the environment. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll follow on from that. Yeah, definitely um, to reiterate, Jay said more baseline surveys when we started. I mean, I think that um, from a policy point of view, they should have been part of countryside stewardship schemes to have a, a baseline to understand what you were doing as a, as a capital item. So we'd really like to know 
you know, we've put it, we've got 72 hectares of um, interventions in, are they having the desired effect? Um, and also from a water quality point of view, we've, we've got a lot of the River D with um, about four and a half million people take their drinking water from two abstraction points on the farm. So we're under quite a lot of scrutiny from that point of view, but we don't often get the sort of feedback we need from the water companies, whether it's because there's nothing wrong, but it'd be really interesting to understand more about um, what their need, what their problems are and how we can tie up to, to solve them together. Brilliant. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely I focus a lot with, with our work on partnerships on you know, nobody's in it. We're on it on our own. We're never going to be getting there. It's about working together with agriculture, all sorts of partners that are that are out there. Um, just picking up some of the questions, Jake, but I think it ties into Charlie as well on how have you been able to reduce particularly plant protection inputs? um particularly herbicides fungicides insecticides and those sort of things what's your thoughts on the how would the ag chem sector look at, at the sort of changes that you've made yeah it's, it's really interesting you look at some of the ag uh yeah ag chem sectors and what they're investing in now in terms of biological uh products and biostimulants and things like that which tells you quite a lot about their train of thought um and also if you look at the plant protection products which are now licensed in the uk um, and how they've dwindled over the last sort of, you know, half a dozen years um, also shows you the, the direction of travel. Where we've been cutting back, uh, we switched um, to a non-insecticide policy here probably four years ago. And I think as a single influencer in terms of our, our insect life and our, um, you know, bird life, that's made a huge, a huge positive step forward. Uh, we're finding rove beetles, carabid beetles, you know, in their in their droves now crawling around all over the place. So that's been fantastic. We're also not using fungicide seed dressings anymore. So again, if we're trying to promote soil health and produce fungi in the soil to uh, to move nutrients around, the last thing we want to do is put a fungicide in right next to where the seed is, where we want the fungus to be. Um, and there's a lot of argument about, you know, the right fungus and the wrong fungus. But actually, um, you know, if you have a balanced, a balanced, healthy soil, you're going to have goodies and baddies in there. You've just got to make sure the baddies survive. Uh, sorry, the, the baddies get predated by the good ones. Um, so those are the two two big savings. And then fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer. We're down about 25 percent on where we were uh, pre regenerative agriculture farming. So by having uh, legumes in lots of our cover crops, we're, we're building soil fertility, uh, we're building organic matter, um, and we're also having you know, more bugs in the soil which excrete carbon and nitrogen, and when they die, they are carbon and nitrogen as well. So um, that whole cycle um, is, is sort of happening faster and faster. Charlie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, a, a, bit, uh, a, a bit like Jake, we're finding that um, as we're increasing soil organic matter and the bacteria in there is getting more, getting more vigorous plants that require less inputs in general to, to keep them growing um, and keep them healthy. I think the, um, the policy of zero insecticides, we've had that for a while. The, um, the, the passion of the sort of game department on the estates being a grey partridge project. So uh, for chick survival, the amount of invertebrates in the spring has been absolutely critical, uh, and this has been monitored quite closely. So we we stopped uh, we stopped using any insecticide of broadacre um, probably five or six years ago now. And again, like Jake, we've seen a a, a great increase in um, the invertebrate samples on the farm. We've uh, on the fertilizer side of things. Um, some sort of headline figures that we calculated if we didn't have the dairy herd we think we'd be spending about another 184,000 quid a year on um fertilizer inputs the uh, the other one is we've we've managed to save about 63,000 a year um in in plant protection products um since we sort of built a more integrated farming system um in 2014 so it's uh, there's some pretty weighty numbers in there um, again, every year is different, isn't it? And some years we do find we have um, we have some problems that we do resort back to the bottle for, but it's definitely a trend in in the right direction. 
Yeah, certainly, you know, everybody talking about regen ag, a lot of it is about providing that resilience in the system so that you can kind of take some of those knocks that come through. And, and you know, one of the big things that comes through in regen ag is it's about embracing diversity and those sort of things. There's a lot of talk around cover crops and that sort of stuff. Have you done any work looking at the cost effectiveness, the cost benefit of different cover crops and tying into that, bringing in other crops into the rotation so that spuds, onions, some of those more... Uh, uh, could you call it soil destructive crops? And then, you know, any challenges and questions around, and you know, well, thoughts around bringing and introducing livestock into rotation, which are both kind of key things on, on those. And who wants to dive in first on that one? Yeah, I can do if you want. We, we, we uh, decided spuds weren't a good idea on heavy clay in uh, about 2004 after um, having about a, a peak of about a thousand acres. Uh, here and some really nasty powdery scab problems and all the rest of it. So we, we pushed them out of the farm um, and haven't regretted it. We've got the infrastructure in place, which allows us to use the nutrients uh, as I sort of described in the presentation. Um, on the livestock integration side of it, yeah, I mean, as I said, the savings we're making in fertilizer by having the dairy there, the ability to upcycle some less productive areas of the farm um, it's just been a win-win all round, um, and I think with more sort of young farmers and think people looking at other opportunities to develop um, livestock enterprises, we've teamed up with a um, a guy who actually works for us in the summer. He's got a lot of sheep. He brings them and grazes some of the sort of forage rye and stubble turnips that we put in um, in certain bits of the farm, and it's just a nice tie-up with someone that's working for us. We're working with him, and we're we're both getting benefits from it. Um, there's another part of that question, Rich. What was it? I've, uh, I've... Uh, it was kind of, well, it was looking at diversity, but also looking at kind of cost benefits and those sort of things, you know. Yeah, so on, on we're well, perhaps not cover cropping to the extent Jake is. Again, we're, we're really focused on um, winter cropping because, as I mentioned, the spring really doesn't suit this farm. We're quite heavy clay. We've been dry for the last couple of years. Um, we like to focus our efforts on getting the nutrition on getting the organic manures out in the spring um but at the same time we've introduced some more diverse whole crop mixtures for you know we've tried triticalium vetch um barley and peas you know a cereal and a legume mixture which has really um, benefited as low input nitrogen fixing the pollinators get a great benefit from it in terms of the sort of benefit for the following crop um, i'm not really i can't really put any figures to that uh, my gut feeling is that um there's definitely nothing to lose so uh yeah jake will probably be able to tell you tell you more more than i can on that on that on that side of things jake <laughs> good leading i'll, I'll do <laughs> um, the figures are a bit foggy but we did some work in 2014 with the kellogg's origins group uh, and ron stobart at niab um, and we were looking there, and if you take nitrogen, for instance, on the uh, vetch and rye um, cover crop, we were sequestering um, about 200 kilos of nitrogen in the canopy for about a seed cost of 60 quid. Well, you know, that, that, is, that is more value in the nitrogen that the seed, than the seed was actually costing. So the, the difficulty we have is gauging and judging when that sort of nitrogen is returned back into the system. The fact that it's held in a biological form means it's not going to be leached away which i think is really important from a water quality point of view it's just a case of when that becomes available is it the following crop that the next crop or the crop after that and there are so many variables uh, in soil moisture biological activity in the soil all these things uh you know have it have an impact on on when that when that return is made um in terms of the other cropping yeah like um, like charlie we've sort of ditched potatoes with a with a neighbor um, and some of the onions, but we are carrying on with beetroot, dwarf French beans, and, and hand-picked peas. Um, and the dwarf French beans and the peas, actually, we're, we're doing no-till now. Peas we've done for the last five years. Uh, and dwarf French beans, actually, we did the first field or part drilling for them yesterday. Um, I, I, have a, I have a huge um, kind of conundrum, I suppose. In the country, we don't eat enough vegetables. As a country, we don't grow enough vegetables. Um, so how do we get veg onto farm without the effect on the soil? And, and I think by working with, um, with veg growers who are, who are interested and keen uh, on coming on this journey, I think there are certainly opportunities 
to be able to try these sorts of things out. Um, so we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, but I'm I'm quite excited about that. Um, and in terms of some of the other cost benefits uh, and bringing sort of GS4 grass and grazing mixes into the arable rotation, we just started. We've been starting that for three years ago. We put the first ones in, uh, not in a stewardship um, sort of capacity, but just as a, a rotational um, uh, sort of investment, really. Uh, and that's that's allowed the sheep to um, to be able to have a break away from the permanent pasture and get onto some arable crops. That's helping to reduce worm burdens. Um, and things like that. And we're also this year growing some cereals and peas combined, a bit like what Charlie was just talking about, um, for a neighbour um, who wants to make some hay out of that later in the year. So um, we shall see how that goes, but, but really interested in that sort of collaboration. Uh, that'll be oats and vetch together um, to see how we, can, um, how we can work together. It should come off in good time to get a good establishment of oilseed rape in after that crop. Brilliant, thanks. I'm conscious that the uh, time is ticking along. I'm going to grab a quick, quick question before I hand over. Um, in terms of your decisions, there's lots of decisions that both of you guys are making every single day. How much of them are based on instinct? How much on science? What, what's helping you shape that? Really quick final question before we uh, hand over to Tim. That's a, that's a really tough question to finish <laughs> off with. Um, I think some of it's experience, just like Charlie was saying about where, where we put the stewardship, you know, bits and pieces around the farm. We, we, you know, there's no substitute for being out on the farm. Technology is certainly helping, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, Charlie's LADAR mapping, LIDAR mapping, um, satellite imagery, that sort of stuff. So uh, there's a little bit of science. Um, there's an awful lot of gut feeling about, um, you know, previous experience and actually what feels right. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I I completely agree with Jake. It's um, I think it, a lot of a lot of gut feeling, but we've now getting to a stage where we've got real time data at our finger pits. We can back up our gut feeling with. So whether we look at a satellite, we've put a drone up, um, or we just nip out on the quad and, and have a look. There's um, there's no substitute for that. And I think it, it gets talked about a lot, but uh, I, I have a spade with me in the truck at all times, and I think that's a sort of key management tool that everyone should have um it's yeah it's, you just learn so much from just having a having a dig and um seeing what's there brilliant thanks jake thanks charlie i think it, we probably could talk for another hour or so apologies to uh, those people whose questions we didn't get to uh, hopefully I, I pulled most of the, the themes out there but yeah thanks both of you and uh, tim over to you yeah, great well, guys thank you so much i mean that was absolutely fascinating and so timely you know as we are starting to think about how can we use land in the most productive way to actually make sure we've got financially viable farms but also we're delivering the needs of nature and of course in the context of anglian water how do we protect these really precious river systems that we all rely on for for water so yeah thank you so much for giving such concise perspectives on what we all need to be doing and i think this is probably as i keep saying the beginning of the conversation rather than the end so yeah, just thank you very much. And I think everyone would have taken a huge amount from this.